For as long as humans were confined to the ground beneath our feet, there has been a general sense that what is above us is some bizarre combination of unbelievable, majestic, and somehow mysterious. Long before we achieved flight and launched ourselves into space, we still looked into the unknown cosmos and dreamed it was full of gods and unknown beings. But even when we mastered flight and started to take to the skies with regularity, there still remained the intrigue. Even as we understood the space around us and the names of planets and how the solar system functions, there still remained that little lingering doubt. Are we really alone? Frederick Valentich, born 9th of June 1958, was making moves to pursue his aviation dreams. He had already achieved a class 4 instrument rating, which was enough to allow him to fly by night, but only under the condition that he had sufficient visuals to observe what is classed as visual meteorological disturbances. While he had applied twice for the Royal Australian Air Force, he had been rejected both times due to the lack of educational qualifications. However, he persisted in his dream and applied himself to the RAAF or RAF Air Training Corps. And there's always going to be somebody in the comments that's like, no, you, you don't say the acronym, you say RAF. And if I say RAF, people are like, no, you say the acronym. You can never be right. But that is to say that despite whatever details we are going to go over shortly and Frederick's young age and his apparent expertise, by the time he had turned 20, he had only undergone less than 150 hours of solo flying time. In the weeks and months preceding his disappearance, it seemed as though Frederick was struggling to get anything to go his way. As well as his failure to join the RAF, his efforts to pursue a career as a commercial pilot didn't seem to be getting off to the best start. While he was only studying for this qualification part-time, he'd still managed to fail all five of his exam elements and did the same on his initial reset. Just a couple of months prior to his disappearance, he had retaken them again and been told that while he had managed to achieve the required level in two of the subjects, the other three were absolute failures. It would seem from an outsider's perspective that maybe aviation wasn't the right fit for Frederick, but he was nothing if not persistent, which in life, most of the time, it's just running your head against the wall until finally you crack through that wall. Advice from Roanoke. But despite his short number of hours flown, he had already managed to receive a number of reprimands for his conduct while flying. Twice he was cited for flying in a cloud on purpose, losing all his visibility, and once for entering restricted airspace. There were some aspects to his background that also gave others a little pause as to his suitability for flying. He seemed to have a particular infatuation with all things UFO and extraterrestrial related. He watched any films he could get about the matter and read any and all articles available on the topic. He also believed that he had witnessed a UFO himself earlier that same year. On the 21st of October 1978, Frederick was planning a relatively short flight of roughly 125 nautical miles to King Island. The airport he was departing would be the Morabin Airport, just outside of Melbourne, and the flight path would take him partially across the Bass Strait, the body of water that separates mainland Australia from Tasmania. At this point, the sun was starting to go down and it was getting towards evening, but Frederick's certification allowed him to still fly if conditions were favorable. The reasons he gave for this planned flight depended on really who you asked. Some people he told that he intended to go pick up some friends on King Island, others that he was going to go pick up some crayfish or crawfish, really doesn't matter how you pronounce it. But neither of those seemed to be true after the fact, because the airport at King Island never received notification from him that he intended to land there, as would be normal procedure. At 1819, or 619, he departed Morabin Airport in his Cessna 182, headed along the coast on his first leg of his flight. It was 1906 or 706 in the evening when contact was made between Frederick and air traffic control at Melbourne, and the communication quickly showed that something was a little strange, and what was going on in the skies, nobody quite knew. The first interaction is Fred asking ATC in Melbourne if there are any known flights in the area since he was clearly spotting something even at his relatively low altitude. DSJ Melbourne, this is Delta Sierra Juliet. Is there any known traffic below 5,000? Sierra Juliet, no known traffic. DSJ, I am. Seems to be a large aircraft below 5,000. Sierra Juliet, what type of aircraft is it? DSJ, I cannot confirm it is four bright, well, it seems like landing lights. When air traffic control confirms that there is nothing showing up on their screens in the area, Fred states that it looks like to him like four landing lights of a very large aircraft. Then the unknown object flies over him as he continues to speak to the tower. DSJ Melbourne, this is Delta Sierra Juliet. The aircraft has just passed over me at at least a thousand feet above. Sierra Juliet, Roger, and it is a large aircraft, confirm. DSJ, due to its speed that it's traveling, is there any Air Force activity in the vicinity? 
Sierra Juliet, no known aircraft in the vicinity. DSJ Melbourne, it's approaching now from due east towards me. DSJ. DSJ, it seems to me that he's playing some sort of game. He's flying over me two, three times at speeds I could not identify. Sierra Juliet, Roger, what is your actual level? DSJ, my level is four and a half thousand, four five zero zero. Sierra Juliet, and you confirm you cannot identify the aircraft? DSJ, affirmative. Sierra Juliet, Roger, stand by. This exchange, or the end of it at least, lets us clarify that he was at an altitude of 4,500 at the point, and if there were in fact any other aircraft around him, they should have been visible on air traffic control screen. It also sounds as though whatever was in the sky that night with him is flying above him, past him, and toying with him. DSJ Melbourne, Delta Sierra Juliet, it's not an aircraft, it is... Sierra Juliet, can you describe the uh, aircraft? Sierra Juliet, as it's flying past, it's a long shape. Cannot identify more than it has such speed. It's before me right now in Melbourne. Sierra Juliet, Roger, and how large would the object be? Melbourne, it seems like it's stationary. What it's doing right now is orbiting, and the thing is just orbiting on top of me also. It's got a green light and sort of a metallic, like, it's all shiny on the outside. It just vanished. It is now only four minutes since he made his first encounter with the unidentified aircraft, and we get the first physical descriptions of it, as sparse as those may be. A long shape with a green light and metallic shiny outer coating. Fifteen seconds after that transmission stating it just vanished, the communications start again. DSJ Melbourne, would you know what kind of aircraft I've got? Is it a military aircraft? Sierra Juliet, confirm the aircraft just vanished? Say again? Sierra Juliet, is the aircraft still with you? Sierra Juliet, it's now approaching from the southwest. The engine is rough idling. I've got to set at least 23 or 24, and this thing is coughing. Roger, what are your intentions? DSJ, my intentions are uh, to go to King Island, uh, Melbourne. The strange aircraft is hovering on top of me again. It's hovering, and it's not an aircraft. Melbourne. After saying that the aircraft is back and hovering around him again, Fred now reports engine trouble. It started sputtering and showing signs of stalling out. His clothing line of exchange is it's hovering and it's not an aircraft, and that would be his last communication between the plane and air traffic control. No further contact was made between air traffic control and the aircraft at this point, and King Island Airport never recorded the arrival or passing of the Cessna aircraft either at that time that it was to be expected or beyond. In the following days, planes that were flying around the same route and around that area kept a lookout for like any signs of either wreckage or life, but none was ever found. One pilot though thought he saw what could have been a wreck of a similar sized plane in the water, but failed to note the location exactly and could not find it again. And just like that, the question came up, what happened that evening? What was in the sky with Frederick Valentich? Was it of this world? Or is there a completely different explanation somewhere that explains the odd circumstances? One of the first suggestions, and arguably the one that kept it in the public mind for so long, is wrapped up in the final recorded communication with Melbourne ATC. It's hovering, and it's not an aircraft. Even the most skeptical of minds, that seems fairly conclusive, that whatever it was tailing the aircraft that evening, or at least appeared to the pilot himself as though, it was not another plane. People who believe this theory and think that it was a UFO of some description point to the fact that while Fredericks wasn't a hugely seasoned pilot, he had a decent amount of hours under his belt. He was clearly a man who was enthusiastic about aviation and one who would be able to identify most normal and expected aircraft. There was also some other reports at that time by a man who said he saw the aircraft from King Island and it looked as though there was something hovering above it, something with a green light. More than a month after the disappearance, a man by the name of Roy Manifold came out with the claim that he had set up a camera along the proposed flight route of that night. His intentions were to capture the sunset, but instead he got a shot where there was a distinct dark blob in the upper right of the frame. Although he thought it was just damaged film, there were no issues with the camera or any of the equipment. He had managed to capture the UFO on film en route to abduct Frederick. A farmer would later claim, many years after the fact, to have seen the missing plane the morning after the disappearance. He said that a mysterious flying aircraft that measured nearly 100 feet across hovered above his farm that next morning, with the missing Cessna stuck to the side of it. He was certain it was the exact same plane that had gone missing, since he scratched the ID number down and also noted it was leaking a bit of oil. However, when he told a few friends, they reacted with laughter and disbelief, and he chose not to take the sighting any further. 
Those that disagree with the UFO hypothesis point to a number of things. The first being Frederick's own seeming infatuation with UFOs. That meant that he was a lot more likely than most to see something in the sky that he didn't recognize immediately and then decide that it was in fact a UFO. The four white lights that he initially saw have been theorized to have actually been a set of celestial bodies that would have been visible at the time given his flight path. The shimmering outlines of the night sky of three planets that would have been fairly clear in the darkness above. Mars, Mercury, and Venus. The fourth light was Earth. No, it's not. But the fourth light would be a star known as Antares. These four white lights in the sky, which would have appeared to have been arranged in a diamond pattern, could have easily appeared to the young pilot, just like the landing lights of an aircraft. But the very appearance of what seemed like unknown landing lights hovering above the small plane would be enough to send anyone into a state of stress. Did this factor into the events that night? Some who have reviewed all available evidence and researched the case have suggested that Frederick may have been suffering from some mental distress at the time of the flight. Is it possible that his mind simply broke under the strain of repeated exam failures and seemingly endless blockades put in the way of his chosen career? That he either saw the lights or somehow mentally just assumed it was a UFO, and once he had made that assertion, the rest of the event simply continued apace due to his confirmation bias? Or, in a slightly more sinister suggestion, were there actually any lights spotted by Frederick at all that night? Some have pointed that two different reasons he gave for setting out for his flight, and the fact that neither was true. The thought that there may be a third and more private reason also exists. This young pilot, infatuated as he was with the very idea of UFOs, had recently reported spotting one. Was his real intention that night to simply try and find another one? Or, if that was the case, how likely is it, really, that out of all the incredible number of commercial and military flights that take off daily from all over the world, the one that set off to seek an alien encounter managed it. And this is why some think there's a possibility that Frederick set off with the sole intention of hoaxing an alien encounter, planning to be vague with his intentions and locations, and then call in this bizarre sighting before disappearing from all view. There is a chance that he had reported his previous sightings to others and then was met with ridicule. There is every chance that he was feeling down about the prospects for flying and ever making a name for himself in aviation. With that being the case, what better way to cement your name in history than to experience a UFO encounter and promptly disappear from the face of the Earth? The aircraft had taken off with more than enough fuel to reach its stated destination and, in fact, had a range that was far beyond it. It was capable of covering 500 miles or 800 kilometers, in fact, and despite his reported position when he was speaking to ATC, they never picked him up on their instruments, which seems to imply that he was either not where he said he was or where he thought he was. Given the fact that no absolute definitive proof of the Cessna's wreckage has ever been found, we are left to wonder if he ended his communications and just simply landed somewhere else, and faded into both obscurity and fame simultaneously. While there were portions of the Cessna located at a later date and it was assessed to have been possible that it floated there from the suggested crash site, there was no exact proof it was this particular craft, only that it could be from the area and was from a series that was basically specific to the aircraft between a certain range of serial numbers. If you combine this with the fact that this discovery was five years after the disappearance and the analysis conducted a number of years after that, there are too many parts of that that lack any sort of definitive proof to say with any confidence that his plane was found. One of the possibilities offered for why the plane disappeared, although really not the encounter, is some combination of mechanical failure or pilot error. As to the first, without any confirmed wreckage being recovered, it is completely impossible to tell if a catastrophic mechanical malfunction brought down the Cessna somewhere along its flight path. While there is a short part in the exchange with ATC where Fred described the engine as rough idling, he doesn't report any more dramatic or serious faults after that. Without a wreckage to examine, and even with one after all this time, it seems impossible to either confirm or rule out all the possible mechanical issues that would cause the plane to ditch into the ocean. And even if we were able, it would do nothing to explain what Frederick reported seeing and encountering that night. The second suggestion is that the pilot error somehow contributed to the crash, and maybe his experience of the encounter is to blame. An early suggestion proposed was that somehow Frederick managed to accidentally invert his plane and was flying upside down. The lights he saw above him were actually his own lights reflected in the water below him. 
While there are various tenuous explanations of how someone could accidentally end up flying upside down, this one is fairly easily dismissed by the lack of mechanical failure. And also, just remember, I believe it was one of the members of the Kennedy family kind of did the same thing. He flew into the ocean, I believe it was near uh, Long Island or right around there, because he thought it was the sky above him. It does happen if you're not paying attention to your instrumentation. During the course of the exchange with ATC, Frederick spends minutes explaining what he is seeing and how the unknown aircraft is behaving. It is only towards the end that he describes his engine beginning to falter a little. Due to the construction of the engine installed in the Cessna he was in on that day, almost as soon as he inverted the plane, if that is what happened, the fuel supply would have died and the engine stalled out. A second and maybe more plausible suggestion of pilot error was offered in 2013 by a U.S. Air Force pilot and an author who had reviewed all available data. Their theory hinges on a number of things. The first is that Frederick was confused by what is known as the illusion of a tilted horizon. This is where visually the horizon seems to be sitting at an angle, even though in reality it is completely horizontal. This can be caused when some part of the horizon is obscured or if some optical illusion of a sunset distorts the view of the pilot. However, the instruments will always be correct, but this relies on the pilot actively checking them. These two men suggest that Frederick tried to correct his plane's position in order to be level with the horizon, but instead started banking down towards the ground. They ascribe to the suggestion we discussed earlier, where these four celestial bodies in a diamond shaped could have deceived Frederick into seeing like landing lights of another aircraft, but again, those were celestial bodies. But now he was beginning to enter into a deadly spiral, turning his aircraft in on itself, losing altitude by the second. And since he was concentrating so much on the apparent UFO that was directly above him, he was not paying attention to his instruments that would have showed him what was really happening. The sudden appearance of a green light on the other craft can be examined by either a reflection of his own navigation lights on his starboard wing reflecting into his cockpit. Or even more worryingly, when he had entered the final stages of his spin, seeing it out of his own window. This ever-increasing spiral down would apparently account for the behavior of the engine as well as while inversion would kill its fuel immediately. A spin getting tighter and faster would slowly throttle the supply of fuel available, possibly leading to the rough idling as described. In amongst a sea of theories and suggestions where no definitive proof is seemingly going to ever appear, it could be argued that this may make the most sense. But in the end, people will always have questions about a mystery like that, and it's going to forever lack definitive answers, unfortunately. Many will look at the graveyard spiral or tilted horizon theory and feel that it ticks enough boxes to tie the situation up in a fairly neat box. For others, this will never be the case. It does little to explain the alleged sightings and others reported, albeit anonymously, from that night and around that time. It relies on the supposition and guesswork, but that is all we really have left. For the people that choose to believe or want to believe in an alien craft and their close encounters with us here spinning around on our little blue marble, this is one of those stories that simply will not die. We are still discussing it today, I mean look at this channel, decades after it happened, and long after any meaningful or concrete conclusions can be made. The line of, it's not an aircraft, will live on as possibly some of the most chilling last words to hear from any human being on the face of the planet. And to those who are skeptical by nature or tend not to believe in these sort of things, it is the other facts of the matter that will stick out. A young man with a fascination and fixation on UFOs just so happened to spot one and then not long after encounter another one and disappear. That seems like a fairly unlikely combination of events in the face of it. Or is it more likely that a man who was by all accounts obsessed with all things UFO saw four lights and mentally filled in the blanks? Was the size of the UFO, the metallic color, and the sudden green light just the product of a predisposed mind making reality match with what he was seeing? We will never really know and can never know, but whether we choose to think of it as a tragic case of a pilot dying by a series of unfortunate errors or a man abducted by aliens, the fact remains that in all likelihood, Frederick Valentich lost his life on that day. And to him, and those who cared about him, that is the true tragedy of this case. But anyhow, I want to thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed, then leave a like would be fantastic of you. And I do appreciate that as it gets out in the algorithm. And subscribing is a great way to stay up to date on what I post, especially as we approach 200,000 subscribers. I'd also want to thank my Patreon real quick, our patron members. Uh, at the literal Wendigo tier, we have Grayson West. Thank you, sir. Then at the eyewitness to the event, we have Mushroom Dance. And at the first-hand accounts, we have Beaver Malaga. 
Cody, Cherry, Drake. And then at the second hand accounts, we have Kanan Johnson, Justice Davis, and Troy. And to the rest of my patrons, I thank you guys as well. Your help goes a long way towards keeping everything running and is greatly appreciated. But that's going to do it for me. I hope everyone enjoyed, and I'll see y'all in the next one.